So Seamus, I hear the E3 is going on this week. I, I didn't know about it at all until it popped up on YouTube. You know, I have to say the same thing, which is shameful. Like, this is my job now to know when this is coming up. But I, it just completely missed me. I, I've just been immersed in all the, the, the crap I've been doing and mostly playing Prey and writing about Prey. And um, yeah, totally missed it until it began this week, this weekend. Now, we've only had one event so far, which was Ubisoft's Cavalcade of Cringe that they do every year. Like, <laughs> I don't know why. It's kind of weird. Everybody does their stuff on Sunday. And as we record this, it is Saturday night. But Ubisoft, I guess, wants to lead the show off with their show. And the Ubisoft is always so uncomfortable. Not only am I not into their games, but they're the ones that like to have... They love multiplayer online shooters where all the players, you know, they'll hire actors to pretend to be players in this highly scripted thing. Oh, and right. They, Staged and they all talk, event of some kind. Right, and they all talk in character. Like, all right, there's some terrorists in over there. All right, well, we're going to need to breach charge them. All right, you go tango, get those tangos down. And it's like, nobody talks like this. The, nobody. And people, <laughs> I mean, if you ever, if you're selling a multiplayer game to multiplayer people, then you should act like you know what their culture is like. The chat in a multiplayer game is jokes and memes the whole time. People talking over all the plot, you know, the terrorists will be making an ultimatum and everybody else is memeing. And I don't mind that they don't do that, but they're just sort of like so cringy and so awkward and everything feels it's so It's like they're fake. trying to LARP. It's like, it's like a LARPing yeah. event. And you're like, no, no one right. does this. Like they're on their couch, they've got some some beer or something, and they're you know kicking back and doing some shoot mans. Right. So it, Ubisoft is always the low point of the show for me of E3. Um, I was actually looking forward to seeing what E what EA had to say this year, but they are not attending. I mean, attending. I don't think anybody's attending E3. I think everybody's literally phoning it in you know it's all just live streams and canned events because they don't want to they don't want to gather a huge crowd understandable right we get COVID on the ropes but that's no reason to get twenty thousand people in the same building um so but ea will be doing i i'm thankful for this actually ea is doing a thing but they're doing it in two weeks this is what i've wanted for years is for you know it is really hard to cover this giant this giant deluge of news that happens in one weekend and you can't cover it all and some of it gets overlooked and it would be great if they just space it out we've got all friggin summer guys you know each week pick a week and i'll give you you know i and all the other gaming sites will give you your week and we'll, we'll cover your stuff in detail instead of just like especially for when people were attending E3. It's like you're on the show floor, you go to the show, then you meet and greet, you stagger back into your room at 9 p.m., slam out a couple of, you know, 700-word articles, pass out, get up the next morning, do it again. This is not great coverage. E3 is a terrible system. Yeah, it's it's like, it, well, it's a convention, and it's the model from the old days when you the only way to communicate with people was to get them all in one room and like actually right. speak to them. And there was no loudspeakers. Right. And... There was no radio or anything, right? Like that's how you got news right. out. And so it's just like this habitual ceremony that they perform because that's how we've always done it. And that's, that was efficient back when, Hey, it's expensive for us to all fly to one place, but no problem. We can, we, we're going to be filling up a magazine with articles. So we'll just de dedicate this month's issue to these stories. But now right. it's the internet and everything is, is reported on the same day. And this is a horrible way to do that. So I, I like that we're moving away from it. I think this is good. Um, I'm sort of disappointed that because of the timing, I wouldn't mind talking about, I'm excited about tomorrow's shows. I'm really excited about the, the Sunday show of Microsoft Bethesda. You know, Microsoft bought Bethesda this year. 
and now they're two shows. It used to be we had an Xbox show and a Bethesda show, and now that's mm -hmm. the same show. And I'm really, <laughs> really curious how that marriage is working out and if those two are getting along. It seems like they would just let them have their own, like, their own slot. It, I, right. I don't know, maybe it's really super expensive, but come on, you, you're doing this for coverage anyway, right? Right. Why not just, I mean, why not just still have an, a Bethesda show? Actually, maybe Bethesda doesn't have a lot to talk about this year. Mm -hmm. um, I heard some, uh, a few weeks ago, I heard, oh, this year they're going to be talking about Starfield. And then I heard some more rumors. No, Starfield's still a couple years off. And Elder Scrolls is several years off. So if that's true, they've got nothing to show. Maybe just, you know, concept art cutscenes um it'll be better than nothing right but so we're gonna see this is this is where we'll probably see what move xbox what move microsoft wanted to make they they bought zenimax media which owns bethesda right and mm -hmm. we we wondered okay what's your plan here and i mean the obvious the surface level thing is just take bethesda games off of the playstation so that they're P PC slash Xbox um, exclusives, mm -hmm. but uh, but I'd like to think they have more plan than that. Um, so whatever that plan is, we will probably see our first glimpse of it tomorrow. Uh, from our perspective, from the perspective of the people listening to this podcast, this all happened yesterday, and I'll cover this as I can on Tuesday. You know, two days late, as is my habit. It's like reverse prophecy, where we're just talking about stuff that we don't know because it hasn't happened yet, right. but it's already happened for you. Right. Um, and I should have known that E3 was coming because we got some game announcements. And I was like, we got two at once. And I was like, oh, that's weird, announcing two games at, on the same day. That's kind of fun. It just, it's not that that's not allowed to happen. It's just that's unusual. But now I realize, oh, these are these were in preparation or in leading up to E3. That was the festivity started, and I was so oblivious. Even on Friday, I still didn't know that E3 started the next day. So the the first the first game that I saw announced was Anna Cruzis. Um, you might remember a few weeks ago we talked about Back for Blood, where the original yeah. design yeah the designers of Left for Dead went off and made Back for Blood. And now we discover that the writer for Left for Dead, Chet Falizek, um, okay, to explain who Chet Falizek is, way back in the aughts, I mean, I'm talking about like turn of the century, there was an old site called Old Man Murray. The two headlining writers on that site were Chet, Faliz Chet Falizek and Eric Wolpaw. And they were the creative force behind that. And that site, Old Man Murray, is a big reason I became a writer. Like I read there, I loved their site so much. It made me, I, I want to do that too, right? Yeah. And they're both it, legends. They are both legends. Eric Wolpaw went on to write Portal and Chet Falizek went on to write Left for Dead. Like all that wonderful, charming, like Left for Dead is what, 13 years old now? And everybody can still remember Bill, Zoe, um, Lewis and Francis. You ask me the name of four characters in any game, <laughs> you know, any other game that came out that year, I'm not going to remember that. But those characters were so vibrant, even though it wasn't even about them. They were just like... Yeah, it wasn't even a story game, really. No, it wasn't. There's no, there's no resolution to their... Or they didn't have arcs or anything. They were just character flavor. They, they hinted at, oh, this is supposedly a movie and you're playing through the action scenes of it. And you can imagine the rest of the movie that isn't shown. Mm -hmm. But it was so vibrant, I loved it. So now we discover Chet Falizek is also, you know, going off and doing some Left for Dead stuff. He's making Anna Cruzis, which is Left for Dead in space. And uh, you're on a spaceship and the, the uniforms and the ship itself all have a heavy 70s vibe. Like, imagine a show... Hmm. So, maybe even a 60s vibe. Like, 
imagine a show that was like a rival to Star Trek, but with like a way bigger budget. The original series, Star Trek. That's what this show, yeah. that's what this setting looks like. I was going to say, if it was 70s, it would be Star Wars, basically, right? Right. But this is like, um, one guy's got an afro, very 60s afro. Uh, the, the white guy has this necklace that I don't know what it's called, but it's like, you know, a crystal on a rope kind of thing was the kind of thing I saw in the 60s. Or not in the 60s. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm alive in the 60s. Deep V-neck shirt. Right. It would be like some guy would have his shirt half unbuttoned and would have one of these necklaces hanging around his neck. Um, so it's keying into that 70s time period. And I love the art. The characters already, I'm interested to find out who they are. They all look like so interesting. But the, the game itself looks awful. Awful. <laughs> no. It's Left for Dead. So instead of fighting zombies, you're fighting aliens. And it's the exact same alien. Like the same alien using the same animation. So it just has this sort of spammy clone look that is just awful. It looks so... How do I describe it? It doesn't look like a crowd coming at you. It it looks like a rendering bug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, massive. compression error foe. Right, right. Looks and they're they're pure black, so it looks like they're rendering wrong. Oh, no, you're right. It looks like the lights they're not being hit by lights, and it's just it's awful. It looks awful. And you, I would expect there to be, you know, different enemy types moving at different speeds. They would have different animation loops and, and stuff like that. Um, the original Left 4 Dead had it so that you had many different... It would like make different infected. You know, this head, this t-shirt, these pants, right? And mm -hmm. so you'd have some variety. And they were all muted colors, but they, you could see them. And they had different animation loops. Some of them would be very stumbly and some of them would be sprinting and some of them would be kind of head down charging at you so that you don't have the same exact animation loop playing on all of them. Is this like they released early gameplay footage or is this like a rendered trailer that they did? Or It's like a rendered trailer that looks like this, which is just alarming. Oh, no. But, you know, it's not out yet. It's it's months away, I believe. So maybe they'll get this hammered out. But what I'm, I'm afraid of is it'll be this wonderful writing, these vibrant characters, and this awful gameplay. Because, you know, the, the people that designed Left 4 Dead in a mechanical sense are on a different team. The technical people are working on Back 4 Blood. Wow. Yeah. The, the narrative team is here. It's not just Chet Falazek. I keep saying Chet Falazek all by himself. There's somebody else with him, but I don't recognize her name, so I keep forgetting it. Whoever she is, I'm sorry. But she's evidently important, too. So it it's not actually impossible to have good gameplay if you don't have experience making this kind of game. But you do have to like have some ability. Or, I don't know, maybe they just spent all their budget on, on writers. <laughs> right, I hope not. I, I, I really want to. I'm more excited about this than I am for Back for Blood. I don't know. This just has the personality I was looking for, and now I'm worried it'll be a mechanical disaster. So fingers crossed that this is just a bad trailer, and they're gonna get this all ironed out, and we'll have a great game. That that that's the closest I can get to optimism. <laughs> well, it, it'll be interesting to watch all of the cutscenes, I guess. <laughs> right, right. I need to find somebody to play these games with me. I, I, I uh, my son's never interested, and it's not really your thing either. Um, and my wife doesn't play these kinds of games, so I, I don't know. I guess I'm going to be playing with bots. I'm sure if you asked, you get some people to play with you on Steam. Nobody wants to play with me. Well, speaking of single player, uh, I've been playing Dwarf Romantic this last week. Um, I, I thought it was supposed, I thought you were supposed to call them little people. Is it little people romantic? <laughs> I just little people can anybody. be romantic, I suppose. All right. So tell me what this is. So, uh, I think I heard about this from Steam. Steam was like, you might want to play this. 
And then I also heard about it somewhere else, maybe on like um, on the what is everyone playing this week? You did another one of those. Uh, you know, what are you playing this past month or year or whatever? And right. uh, I always I always love those posts because it's so interesting to read people's comments. But I just have right? not had time those... to read through all of them. There's so much content there. Right. They are fast and it is hard to keep up. Like, I know when I do one of those posts, I'm going to really spend a lot of the day reading comments. But it is, it does drive home just how big and diverse the hobby is. Like, how little overlap you'll see. 30 people will all post. They're all playing multiple games and none of them have any games in common. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Also, I, pro I apologize. I have a cough drop in my mouth. If that makes if my m voice sounds a little weird, that's why. Yeah, I think I've got a cold too. So anyway, Dwarf Romantic is is. Um, I don't know if you played Carcassonne, the tabletop uh, board game. I've never even heard of it. It's a classic board game. Kind of um, you match the tile edges. So there's these little tiles, and they're four sided, and you've got uh, cities, fields, roads and and they have to match so it's like dominoes but with hexes yeah yeah well so carcassonne is is squares uh but it's like dominoes yeah and then you can get points for having bigger cities and you can claim cities and stuff but carcassonne is a multiplayer game so this is dwarf romantic is a single player game you don't have to match the edges but you only get points when the edges match and then you can have some of the tiles have little missions on them where it's like, well, connect this to a set of 100 houses or, you know, 200 trees or like a certain number of rivers. So in Dwarf Romantic, there's more than that. Uh, there's uh, what? Trees, fields, um, just plains, you know, grassland, uh, houses, um, rivers or water and railroads. I think I got them all. So those are the those are the different types, and then you can connect them all together and build these large, you know, sprawling things or whatever. And so it's a it's a hype score game. Uh, it's not timed in any way, so it's very you know forgiving for sitting there and pondering things. And um, there's no real end game. Uh, it's just you know try to get as high a score as you can, and then when you get points, you earn more tiles. So you start off with fifty, I think. And then as you complete missions and, you know, get more points, you, you get more tiles. And if you run out, then it's game over. And eventually you, you get a big enough thing that the missions are also hard that you can't do them anymore. Or, or at least that's where oh I'm at. So I've gotten to maybe oh you know, 11,000 or so. I, I looked it up on YouTube. I am immediately in love with this. <laughs> one of the first YouTube oh, yeah, results it's gorgeous. Is, is one of the first videos someone has is Dwarf Romantic, the chillest city building game ever. And just, I mean, I, I am attracted to hex grids naturally. And these are gorgeous. Just like built by people organically as they played the game, made these wonderful, interesting looking maps. I love it. I love it. I'm going to get this game. Please tell me it's on Steam. It's on Steam. It was on sale this oh, last week. Yeah. Um, but it's only like 10 bucks full price, so not a big purchase. Oh, too bad I missed the sale. I'm going to have to pay full price, but still. So yeah, Dorf Romantic. And the, the kids like playing it. Um, you know, they don't get on and plop tiles down. You know, and it won't stop you from placing anything. Or Well, there are very few constraints where you can't place a tile. So it reminds me a lot of Townscaper and of um, Islanders. Reminds me a lot of I Islanders, just, that same kind of... I was just about to say, yeah, I see I see exactly what you mean. It reminds me of those two games, exactly. So, very cool. Uh, very cool little little toy, I guess. And then you can unlock stuff, but I think almost all the unlocks are just... Um, they're just, like, uh, what? Cosmetics? Like, they, they change... There are some tiles that look different from other tiles, but they have the same mechanics attached to them, so there'll be, like, a, a right. field with a deer in it or something instead of just normal field. So is your goal to like clear your hand or is your goal to just play as long as you can before you can put anything else down? High score, okay. So you want to place, ideally you'd place every tile with every edge matching all the other edges in the tiles and you wouldn't have long sprawling structures. You'd have like a compact, fully filled grid to maximize right. your score.
Right, and I can see I can see that in these screenshots. People are trying to do that. And organically, what ends up happening is you end up with cities instead of just random crap just thrown everywhere. You form cities mm -hmm. and forests and fields, you know, farming fields. And that's that's interesting. In attempting to get the highest score possible, you wind up organically creating a plausible-looking map. That is brilliant. Yeah, it's very fun. And the scores are, uh, I, I feel like they're pretty well balanced. I don't, I haven't looked into exactly how the tile rejuvenation works. Like, I think you get five tiles when you complete a mission, but I don't know if you just get a tile for every 20 points because missions are worth 100, or if it's, you only get tiles when you complete missions. So I'm not, I'm not sure how all that works. Anyway, fun little game. I guess I'm going to find out. I bought it. While we were talking, so now I own it. Woo. All right, one of the other games announced is Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Now, this is from Gearbox. Okay, to, to explain the context of this, there's Borderlands 2, right? It was written mm -hmm. by Anthony Birch, and it was brilliant. Everybody loved it. Not everybody. It had its critics, but I loved it. And I thought I really liked the sense of humor and the sensibilities of the game. But what I liked even more was the DLC for it called Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep. And the premise yes. of it is that all the characters from the game sit down and play um, Bunkers and Badasses, which is obviously just a D&D ripoff. And, right. And, and Tina is one of the characters from Borderlands 2. Right. And it... I love Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep so much. It is just packed with ideas. It uh, Borderlands as a whole suffers a bit from, that's a great joke. Oh, yep, there it is again. That's, yeah, I really like that joke. Oh, oh okay, yeah, just tell the joke a third time. Okay, fourth time, we're going to tell the joke again. Okay, I'm officially tired of this joke. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hours later, it's like, oh, I remember when this joke was funny. <laughs> and Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep doesn't have that problem because it's so full of ideas it basically tells the joke and moves on mm. and, and it's probably drawing from RPG like tabletop RPG right. stuff all the time right well it, it makes fun of looter shooters which it is it also <laughs> makes fun of or, MMOs. Or it's, a, it's, it's set in a, a looter shooter world, right? Or is it actually a looter right. shooter itself? It is a looter shooter. It's just the normal Borderlands gameplay. I mean, you're fighting knights and dragons, with, you know, and guys with swords and skeletons with swords, but you're you're still firing, you know, acid shotguns at them. <laughs> and the game oh, makes weird. no no effort to reconcile this. It's like, yep, that's silly. We're gonna keep going, <laughs> and. But it may it also on top of looter shooter jokes it makes it talks about tabletop games and it also talks about MMOs and it talks about online games in general and yeah it's just and it's just so full of ideas I love it so Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep is not just the best part of Borderlands 2 I think it's my favorite DLC for anything ever like it is better than the core game ah wow now the sad thing is it. Anthony Birch left Gearbox and did not write Borderlands 3, and you can feel the difference. And the new writer really tried to copy his style, and they didn't pull it off. And it just feels mm. kind of a little cringe and a little annoying and a little awkward. Not horrible. Like, I, I, don't, I don't get offended. It's not outrageous. It's just like, okay, good, good try, but th this doesn't work for me. I would not call it a bad writer. I would call it Probably a perfectly fine writer that tried to do something very difficult and failed. Right. Yeah. Aping another another creative person's style is master class level stuff. If you can pull it off, right. it's amazing. But it's really hard. And in particular, Anthony Birch is pretty idiosyncratic and, and zeroing in on his particular style is really hard. So I was disappointed in Borderlands 3, both mechanically and narratively. And none of it was like bad enough to make me angry. It was just sort of this generalized sense of disappointment. 
nobody mm. did a bad job. It's just they couldn't do as well as the previous game. And it was a letdown. Um, but now they're announcing Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is a standalone game. And it looks like it's the same premise. Tiny Tina's running a tabletop game of some sort, and you're going to play it. And on one hand, oh boy, this is, they're going to try, this is my favorite, this DLC is one of my favorite things ever. And they're trying to do more of it. That's great. On the other hand, they're trying to do it with, without Anthony Birch. Is that even possible? Was Anthony Birch part of the original Tiny Tina's Assault and Dragon Cube? Yes. Yeah, he was the uh. he was the voice behind it. He was in fact that is the most his style. Like Borderlands 2 <laughs> is his style mixed with everybody else and Assault on Dragon's Keep, it was kind of you could tell it was all Anthony's. Wow. Um where he just got to work with his own stuff instead of having to like also work with other writers that were trying to maintain the Borderlands, you know, lore and universe. He got to make his own thing, and it was really strong. And now he's not going to be working a time. So on one hand, I'm super excited, and on the other hand, I'm apprehensive. I don't know. It, it could be another Borderlands 3-level disappointment. Well, is there any hint as to which direction it's leaning? No, that's what's so frustrating. We just got a teaser trailer, and that's not enough. I mean, it, here's the other funny thing is... The star of these Tiny Tina games is Tiny Tina, obviously. It's, that's voiced by Ashley Birch, Anthony Birch's sister. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. So it sounds like Tiny Tina. You know, it's, Aunt, it's Ashley Birch doing her thing, and she's fantastic. And so that's great. And you're like, oh boy, oh boy, it's Tiny Tina. But that doesn't mean that the writing will be there. Yeah. Right, so you can't tell. It feels it feels right so far, but I don't know. Um, they they do the the teaser trailer does feel not as funny as if it was made by Anthony Birch. You could kind of see the joke coming. It it pretends to be a great big bombastic swords and sorcery trailer, you know, that takes itself seriously, but you can tell it it's too overblown. There's supposed to be a big a big twist. Ha <laughs> ha, we're just kidding. It's all goofy nonsense. But it's like, yeah, we saw that coming. So, it, it, mm. you know. It's it leaning it's, a little bit into the thing that it was making fun of before. Right. I don't know. I don't know. It could be fine. It could be fine. I'm going to buy it no matter what. So, I, I don't know. I'm excited. I'm excited. Maybe we'll get another dose of that. And there's always the original if it doesn't pan out. Right. The original is still good. So you remember uh, some months ago we did an episode on Star Citizen. Oh, that's that's one of my favorite episodes that you and I have ever done together. I think that is the best show you and I have ever done together. I love that. I've I've that's the only one I've gone back to and listened to again because I enjoy it so much. <laughs> it turned out real well. We we're uh, yeah yeah. So it was, it was a good show and. Uh, you know, the, the watch numbers were a little higher than normal because, of course, in the show you said, hey, go watch us on YouTube because there's all this footage. And so it was up around, you know, three, four hundred views or something. And um, then a couple, I, I think last week it was, um, the numbers just started shooting through the roof again. I was like, what is going on? Like, it's up to 800 views and like, what's going on here? So I traced it back and it turns out that the Something Awful forums has linked into our show and there were a couple people who were like oh this is really good like the original post was this is what non-backers feel like when they play star citizen and uh it was like okay all right good like you know we portrayed ourselves well and uh so i just thought it was fascinating that, that someone linked the the thing and then someone else was like oh yeah you should watch this, this is really good and so uh the numbers shot up for a bit that is fascinating to me, especially since this is Goon Swarm we're talking about. And I know these guys. I mean, I don't know any of them. I mean, I know their reputation through Eve, how they basically changed the universe and the course of this this online game by basically going in as a great big group. Um, 
just imagine a hunt. Imagine a group of beer drinking hunters or football player, a football group of guys that socialize around football. All have one too many beers one day and decide to go to the golf course, the fancy, expensive, high end golf course that only rich people hang out at. Uh huh. And they go out and go absolutely nuts on the golf course and their their party is so intense that it changes the shape of the game it changes this golf course they leave an impact on it and it changes the way people play golf on this golf course that's goon swarm when they joined eve online and I'm, I'm not condemning them i mean that's just those are the rules of the game and they played it according to the rules and it was just absolutely fat. I was always cheering against them, but never like, like, oh, I wish they hadn't joined the game. They ruined it. But just kind of, I don't know, just after they started winning everything, you naturally start cheering for the underdogs. Sure. It was... Well, and you can, you can appreciate them acting as an antagonist when the game kind of needed an antagonist. It had settled into some grooves yeah. and things weren't really changing. It's like, hey, this is great. This is, it's, it's interesting again. Right, it was just what it it was just what the universe needed. Like all of these little factions were really complacent; they'd all cut out their little corner of the the universe. And now there's this giant. It's like um, you have a long running TV show, you know, like Star Trek, and oh, it's starting to get in a rut, and everybody's tired, and everybody's sick of fighting Klingons and Romulans. So it's like, hey, we'll bring in the Borg. And that's what the Goom Swarm was. They were like the Borg, this less next level threat that makes the show interesting again. And a lot of these enemy factions had to like put aside their differences and unite to just not to beat the Goon Swarm. Nobody beat the Goon Swarm, but to just stop themselves from being conquered by the Goon Swarm. It made me so happy. It made for awesome stories. And even though I cheered against them the whole way, I I just love that they joined the game. It made just it made it was so interesting. It's one of the most interesting things that's ever happened in an MMO ever. But I didn't realize these guys also were into Star Citizen. I assume there must be a lot of them that got into the Star Citizen if they're I mean if they noticed our little show talking about it. Yeah, well, I mean it, it got another probably like 400 views. So there's at least 400 people in the the goon swarm that are on the on the forums i mean goon swarm is kind of the eve online section of something awful right 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 that's that's um, what i understand and so yeah, yeah I don't know. within I don't know something uh, yeah but within goon swarm there's apparently a large star citizen um faction which makes sense if you're into eve online you're probably into star city you're probably into space stuff yeah yeah, there's there's one thread I kind of poked around a little bit, and there's one thread dedicated to Star Citizen, and uh, you know it gets you know probably I don't know sixty posts a day or something. Interesting. So they liked <laughs> so they liked our our little show. Really, it was all your show. It was your completely earnest, non ranty it, dismay and confusion at at what Star Citizen has created. At the ongoing <laughs> puzzle that is Star Citizen. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a good show. I, so I, when I found out that it was trending, I was like, oh, the Goon Swarm thing. And I like figured it out and I started watching the diecast again. And I also listened to the whole thing again just because I was like, wow, this is good. This is real good. <laughs> right. And it's too bad we can't do that more. I mean, to do a show like that requires somebody else to do something really, really mystifying on a massive scale like that episode that we made cost a hundred million dollars <laughs> yeah we can't do that unless somebody else misspends a hundred million dollars yeah man so it's still got legs that was a good uh that was a good episode well speaking of mishandling things uh do you remember like six months ago hackers breached cd project red and stole like yeah. their code bases and all of this important data and yeah, the source for for cyberpunk or something right 
And like, what a shakeup. Can you imagine? Like, when I when I heard that story, the first thing I thought of is, boy, I, I imagine the first thing I do is Bobby, as Bo, Bobby Kotick, when I got up in the morning, read that story, is I would call my IT group and like, hey, I need you to guarantee this can't happen to us because this is horrible. <laughs> this is just so awful. This is humiliating. And I do not want to be humiliated the way the management of CD Projekt Red is currently being humiliated. Maybe hire some um, external consultants to do a pen test, you know, to to really make sure that our servers are hardened. That's what I would do as Bobby Kotick. Yeah. Well, and the, the scary thing about the CDPR thing was that it looked like it was an inside job, or at least partially an inside job, right? Did it? I, I missed that detail, or I've forgotten it. No, or maybe I made it up. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, they got hacked, and and the industry hopefully took notice and were like, okay, this is a thing that could happen to us. Let's not let that happen. So this week, hackers breached Electronic Arts and stole 780 megabyte 780 gigabytes of data the full Ooh, source code man. for the frostbite engine for several the source code for several games wow I, I i just can't believe that this happened unless it was a, okay if it was an inside job then it was an inside job but it would just be baffling to me if this was actually somebody figured out how to get through electronic arts and gain access to their server from the outside without inside help that you know andrew wilson would not have responded <laughs> would not have called the it department and made sure that everything was very no, no, no you wouldn't call the it department because of course they're going to tell you oh yeah we're solid you would immediately hire outside consultants to make sure that you are protected from this and you would do an Although audit the way that sure. he runs the company and like he runs a video game company doesn't know anything about video games maybe he did <laughs> just call up it and like hey you guys you should probably change the keys on the padlocks on the servers just in case right <laughs> yes maybe we'll get a guard dog for the server room I'm, I'm going to go and make sure uh, that the server is safe myself. I'm going to log in. What is it? Is it the password is secret, right? <laughs> oh, no, you changed it to password one. Okay. That one on the end. I like that. Throw a number in there. Nobody will guess it. <laughs> if, if I worked for the IT at Electronic Arts, I would set up a sandbox just for Andrew Wilson. Be like, here you go. Right. See yeah, if you yeah. can hack into our, our secure servers. It's just a login, login on a Linux box with no users. So it's physically impossible to log in. <laughs> oh, man. So Frostbite is, uh, remind me, what do they use that for? That is their in-house engine, and it gets used for all kinds of, th that's their big shooter engine. They also use it for their sports game, like FIFA uses it. I'm like, really? You have the same engine for Mass Effect Andromeda and FIFA? That That's weird. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, yeah. So, but that means that, like, nobody's going to steal Frostbite and, like, use it without paying the license fee. You can't do that. You can't get away with that. You'll get caught. But it does make it easy to crack things. To yeah, break the, the hackers would love to have that. And now they do. Right. It's like, it's like you're trying to solve a Sudoku, but you've only got two given numbers. Or you've got no given numbers and you just have nowhere to start. And then all of a sudden these hackers yeah. download half the half the the puzzle for you. And it's like, all right, now we've got something to work with. This is no now it's fun. Now it's a game. Now it's a puzzle. Now we can do something and we can solve it. Now yeah. we are highly incentivized. Or, or like if you had a if you had a heist you were planning, right? And there's always like that whole montage of them casing it out and like sitting in cars for weeks and like doing measurements and trying to reverse engineer the plans. And then like the team next door is just like, well, here's the, like we just walked in and took like the schedule and all the floor plans and we've got them all right here on the desk. It's like, it makes yep. it so much easier to figure out where things are and how to get around things. 
you almost feel obligated at that point. Like, I wasn't sure I wanted to be in, but, like, it would be a shame to me to waste all of this. <laughs> yeah. I got the home phone number of everybody on the security staff. This is just, like, this is too easy. Wow. So this would only really be a problem for DRM and multiplayer? Yeah, that's the shame of it, of course, is... It's going to make hacking multiplayer games that much easier. And, um, uh, you know, doing local hacks to unlock things. You can't change what's on the server, but if, a, if, if there's some form of unlock in a single-player game or they want you to pay for certain content, you can crack that probably. It's easier to crack that. You can always crack it, Yeah. now it's easier. Now you see well, apparently how they're they doing can it. change what's on the server also, I mean, at this point. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, it's so crazy. I don't know. What were they thinking? Okay, so now if I'm Bobby Kotick, I am not calling the IT department. I'm showing up in person and I'm going to act like the godfather. I'm going to go in and impress upon them <laughs> how much their personal safety depends on this never happening to me. Oh, man. You need to secure this server. <laughs> you need to secure this server or you're going to wake up with Notch's head in bed with you. <laughs> Oh man. So so what so what motivation I mean other than just like for the hijinks like it seems like there's there's got to be some motivation for somebody to to pull this off cuz it couldn't have been straightforward. Right, it had to be a lot of work. Online I saw a claim, I saw a headline just before the show. I did not read this article because I saw it like 2 minutes before I came into the show. But I saw a headline alleging that they're either offering or getting 28 million for this source. Now, I do not believe Ugh. that for a second. I don't believe that for a second. I do not believe anybody that has 28 million dollars is in the market to buy Frostbite. Didn't like, you hear the same the thing about the source yeah. for CD Project Red's uh, whatever engine? Like that someone was offering right. 10 million or 11 million dollars for it or something? They were asking that much and they claimed they got it. But, you know, it's in a secret auction that took place on the dark web. It's like, yeah, you can claim anything. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I totally huh. sold it for a billion dollars on... Uh, where's my proof? It was on the dark web. You can't prove anything. And all my money is hidden on the dark web. And also, I can't tell you my name or anything about me. Just take my word that what I claim is what exactly happened. Yeah. And ignore the fact that I'm a cyber criminal. On the other hand, there's all those guys who made millions on the the whole uh, shorting um, GameStop. Right. So, you know, that's true. This has... Oh my gosh. That didn't occur to me. Yeah, that would be the real way to make money is short electro... Okay, we find out... Oh, we found a way to hack electronic arts. Okay, don't do it yet. Let me short some Electronic Arts stock, then you announce, and then their stock will fall, and then I'll make the money. Now, that is illegal. In fact, that's illegal twice. It's illegal to hack them, and then <laughs> it's illegal, illegal. to manipulate <laughs> Right, and then it's illegal to manipulate the market like that. But that is a way, legitimate way to make lots and lots of money. So that's well, really illegitimate, as you pointed out. But yeah. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. I wasn't I mean, even that's thinking of that angle. Like, yes, that's true. I, but I was just thinking of the angle of, like, there's these guys that, like, have a bunch of fuck you money sitting around. And maybe right. they want to blow it buying the Frostbite engine. Right. But who are these people that have that much money that don't seem to have anything to do? Like, most people that have that, like, Jeff Bezos has billions of dollars. But he's also, he's got stuff to spend that money on. He's busy. He's got hobbies. He's trying to send himself to space. Same thing with Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. They've got all these crazy hobbies. You know, supercars, super yachts, super spaceships. You know, I'm going to build... Bill Gates back in the day had this insane house that he built. It was filled with technology that was, you know... I'm sure since it was made by Microsoft engineers was like, you know... Every, every three days, his garage door would update and just crush his car when he tried to drive through it. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, 
they have stuff to spend their money on. Why would you mess with... There's all kinds of cool stuff you can buy that will not land you in jail. Why would you mess with this? Yeah, true. I would not... Like, it's cool, but I would not risk jail to see the frost, but... <laughs> And so we can always we could always summon the oh the Russian mafia, but they're like such a common, they're the boogeyman, just this arbitrary force with a lot of money and absolutely no accountability that can do anything. And they, they're Cerberus of the real world. Anytime you anytime you want to justify something outrageous, you can say the Russian mafia did it. And so that yeah. that answer always kind of bugs me. Or the Chinese hackers or whatever. Right. That. Yeah, that's the other one. Chinese hackers or Russian mafia are just, you know, the evil force. They're the Bond villains of the real world. Oh, they could do anything at any time and they got all the money and they have all the resources and anything's possible. Think of the possibility, the Shepard. Yeah. The, the, the fact that they claim to be getting money for it means that it wasn't done by the people who wanted it, right? Like this was a third party that... Right is doing this and then selling it to someone who wants it. It's like, this is very, very confusing. Right. How, right. That you would do that and then you would sell it and then you would announce that you'd sold it. Like if I got $28 million illegitimately, I wouldn't want to tell anybody. I don't want anybody to know I have that much money. All of a sudden, everybody will come along. will suddenly want that money. Hey, where's my cut? Where's my cut? Uh -huh. Wait, you made $28 million on that job? I, how come I didn't get anything? Why don't you PayPal me some money or I'll talk to the feds about, you know, who you are? Like, yeah, no. It's just, very strange. It's very strange. Okay, and, here's a possibility. You know, okay. Maybe it's an AI that doesn't know any better that it shouldn't tell people about it. Maybe it's Facebook. And the Facebook AI <laughs> just wants people to notice it. It just wants the likes. <laughs> it just wants people to press the like button. The face, a Facebook artificial intelligence, and we're talking about, we're not talking about Mark Zuckerberg himself. We're talking about some other artificial intelligence. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up by talking about Two Point Hospital. Hmm. I, um, this was on sale over the weekend. This is what I got instead of Dorf Romantic, and now I'm regretting my choice. I got Two Point Hospital. And it's a, it's a very modern take on theme hospital, if anybody remembers that from 20 years ago. But it's, you know, your classic mm -hmm. building management game, only instead of building, like, an amusement park, you're building a hospital. And me, I, I'm not sure why I'm so into it. Maybe it's because I was just in the hospital a month ago. And so I, I spent, and I'm trying to stay out of the hospital. I've, ne I've nearly gone back a couple times. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm trying very hard to stay out of the hospital. Um, and so I think a lot about hospitals these days. And I don't know, may, that's made me fixate on this ridiculous, on the ridiculous world of Two Point Hospital. I love it because it is ridiculous. And to me, a real hospital is now a terrifying place. Um, you know, a place where you find out, oh, you're dying and also you owe us tons of money. That's the hospitals in the real world. That's how they make me feel now is existential dread and, and, and uh, anxiety over money. But two point hospital is so silly and so lighthearted that I really enjoy it. Like um, the ailments that you have to cure people of are all the, the stupidest puns you've ever heard. But somebody <laughs> decided, somebody decided to run with it. Um, okay, somebody walks in and they're infected with um, a chest infection, not a chest infection, a chest infection with a J. They are literally okay. a they are literally a clown, and you have to make this special little clinic that the person goes in and declowns them. <laughs> like this isn't this is a that is a really stupid pun okay just infection that is like uh -huh. the i thought about it for 30 seconds and this is the first thing i could come up with but then we're going to spend weeks making special models and special devices and you know special animations just for this joke another person they suffer from the pandemic what's the first 
what's the first pun you could make? What's the laziest pun you could make from pandemic? Uh... Oh, you're, you're, you're trying too hard. The word pan. Okay, so somebody suffers from pandemic. They literally have a pan stuck on, like a saucepan stuck on their head. <laughs> and you have to, you have to pry it off. Oh, no. If someone suffers from lightheadedness, their head is literally a light bulb. And you have to get a machine to unscrew the light bulb and replace it with a with a human head. What? What? <laughs> what? Skeletor voice. What? It's ridiculous. <laughs> it is so ridiculous. So you build, build this big silly hospital f to, to treat all these ridiculous ailments. And, you know, manage people, train them. Uh, if somebody dies, like you can't make them better. You just, your doctor failed or you don't have the right equipment or your line's too long and they, ha you know, died waiting for treatment. That's, that's pretty grim. So, the, you know, they want to make it as silly as possible. So the person, you know, does this very over-exaggerated spin around in a circle clutching their, oh, like overacting. They keel over and then a, a ghost rises from their body. And it's a typical, it's a classic bedsheet ghost, right? It's not like, you know, a terrifying ghost. It's a bedsheet costume ghost mm -hmm. that your, your janitor has to chase around and vacuum up with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> like Luigi's Mansion style. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, um, that's, you know, it works as a penalty so that you have some reason to not want people to, to die. And, and having people die makes your hospital worse, costs you money and resources and requires extra personnel to deal with and, and upsets your current patients and, you know, interferes with the staff doing their job because people get frightened of the ghost and run away and stop doing their job. So you want to get this thing quick. So it creates a problem, but it doesn't create a, like a morbid problem of, oh, we have a cadaver in our, just in the middle of the floor of our hospital. And we need to make a morgue and get rid of this body. No, no, no. The body just fades away and turns into this bedsheet ghost. Like the game is really good at taking the grim and upsetting world of hospitals and making it really harmless and silly. Like you could let play, you could let children play this game and it would not be upsetting for them. It's amazing. Hmm. So I've been having a wonderful time with this game and, uh, Maybe that's just because I have so much hospital anxiety, but I think it's just a really good game. That sounds lovely. I know I said we probably wouldn't do any mailbags, but can we do one mail? I want to take care of this Survive the Hunt one. What do you say? Are you up for it? Sure. Let's go. Dear Diecasters, in the beginning of 2020, you put an analysis of Fail Race's Survive the Hunt with a link to episode 12. Since then, they've reached 35 episodes with a few one-off spinoffs or specials. I've been watching ever since your analysis. The Fail Race guys have updated the rules over time to acknowledge some imbalances and make their game better. In particular, they've changed the number of air vehicles allowed, made a rule that high-end supercars were off-limits to hunters unless the prey is caught driving in one, making taking a fast car an important choice with risk versus reward elements, and had a few one-off special rules or scenarios, with the last episode involving an escape the country via plane escape sequence involving a partner in a plane as part of their 10-year anniversary of the site. Are you still keeping up with the series? Are there any other games you diecasters can think of where a healthy dose of setting changes and honor system rules can create a new fun game mode that isn't captured by the gaming community at large? One of the best parts of Survive the Hunt format is that it's a video gamer agnostic. You don't need to be a gamer or even know GTA 5 to understand what the prey's goal is or what might be a good or bad strategy. Are there any games out there with a particular ease of understanding that might make them particularly suited for recording and viewing or the YouTube environment? Nick. All right. Well, I think your dog adequately answered that question. So <laughs> yeah, he was barking in the background, wasn't he? Yeah. What's your dog's name? Poppy. Thank you, Poppy. Uh, and thank you, Nick. Thank you both for your contributions to this show. Uh, to answer your, your question, Nick, I went back. I hadn't been keeping up with the series, but I did go back and watch a few episodes. And for those that don't remember, 
Um, very quickly, Survive the Hunt is... They're playing Grand Theft Auto Online. This is not a game mode that's recognized by the game. You just... One person is the prey. Your job is to drive into the city and blend in with traffic. So you pretend to be an AI. Everybody else, the other 10 players, all come into the city, usually in giant hulking Humvees and supercars, roaring through at max speed. You know, they drive like players. And they're looking for the one real player. And as the as the prey, your job is to is to drive around and find these pink cars and blow them up and then drive away and get away with it without the hunters catching up with you. And there's a bunch of rules like you can't shoot from vehicles and you can't use certain cars and you can't use certain airplanes just cuz you know, they've been trying to balance it so that it's a it's an interesting chase. Right. I love I love it. I love the idea of the game. I wish the I wish it would be incorporated into the game, but I had to stop watching it. Again, for the same reason I stopped watching it originally. Um, the guy who is the prey, who is, you know, the, the, per, the, the lead personality of this group, right? This is their front man. He mm -hmm. is, he's too conservative. He is much too timid. You know, it's, um, he doesn't obey the rule of keep it interesting. He will do the safe, boring thing of like, oh, I don't know. Maybe they're going to see me. I'll just, you know, go around the block three times in this boring car and not go anywhere and not make any progress. And I'm like, no, you're doing this for YouTube. This, it, you need to keep it interesting. You need to take that chance because that makes for a better, that makes for a better viewing experience is to take the chances and constantly being... And so right. I get he's playing angry. In, in a good way in that yes. he wants to play the game properly, but he's not playing for the audience. He's not being a showman. Right. And that's exactly it. it. Like the way he's playing is how I would play if I wanted to win. And you need to be a showman. You need to get out there, take stupid chances. You know, oh, they're chasing me. Oh, I, I don't want to wreck. I'll be very careful and drive in the safest possible way. It's like, no, you're being chased by a bunch of hunters. They've got faster vehicles. Now is the time to go off a crazy, absolutely bonkers jump, bail out of the car mid in the middle of the air, hope you land in the water, and then walk into a crowd of NPCs and hope you get away with it. Like, that's the kind of shenanigans you should be doing. Um, yeah, he never does. It. And if they're doing multiple episodes and they're planning on displaying it, you could always like record three or four play sessions and just yeah. show the best ones. Right, just show the highlight reel. If if there's just too many, like oh, you know, I ran into the city and got caught after five minutes three times in a row. That's not a lot of fun to watch. There's like the ch the chase was over right away, and I just got blown up. I crashed my car and blew, I crashed my car and blew up two minutes into the chase. Oh, that's not that's not fun to watch. But you know, do a highlight reel of all the crazy shenanigans that worked, all the crazy things that I got away with. Oh, it's so I get frustrated at how much better the show could be if somebody else was driving. That that's what frustrates me is. As good as this is, this is a brilliant game mo mode. I love that they found a people that are all work on the... They found a large group of people that are all willing to go on the honor system. It's actually a pain in the ass to play this game. You have to turn off the map and the HUD and player... You have to go in the interface and do all this stuff. Otherwise, the game's automatically over. Like, by default, it shows you player names over their heads. So, you can't right. hide in a group of NPCs. You have to turn off all that stuff. Or else the game will just give it away. So, so everybody's in on the owner system that they have to go out of the way to participate in this. And you can tell they're all obeying the rules because they actually have a hard time finding him. <laughs> and there's long stretches right. of time where nothing happens. And I really respect that. And I love that this group is doing it. But they need... I don't know that their their main driver, the main the main guy, I forget his name, really needs to like drink a bunch of caffeine or go kind of crazy just <laughs> just go crazy keep it interesting and so i can't watch it because i end up yelling at my screen <clears throat> go for it just drive no pull out 
No, get oh, like you you don't know if they'll catch you if you pull out or if they'll catch you if you sit here. So if you don't know what to do between the two, do the one that's more interesting to watch. Don't sit in a parking garage for five minutes <laughs> arguing with yourself about whether or not you should change cars. Do it. Uh, Just do it. Uh, so no, I don't watch Survive the Hunt anymore because I get too frustrated. But it's a brilliant idea. And it's, it's a generally cool group of, of creators. All right, we have many more questions, but uh, we're out of time. Thank you to Nick for that question. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamelessyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. And sorry, Nick, that you, we didn't answer the second part about, like, are there other games like that? But you can just watch YouTube. They're on there. <laughs> <laughs>